Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session on reimagining manufacturing industries for growth. I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran. I'm the US business editor of The Economist, and I'm delighted to chair today's session. We have what has been called something of a, an aha moment in manufacturing with uh, dramatic advances in a range of technologies ranging from 5G, the Internet of Things, 3D printing to uh, advanced uh, forms of uh, materials, advanced forms of business processes to connectivity, uh, remote monitoring. Uh, the list goes on, really, the vanguard of the fourth industrial revolution. And it raises the question, could we be at the light bulb moment for manufacturing uh, when we have a transformative move towards the factory of the future? I would say, take a look at history and be careful what you wish for. Uh, Thomas Edison and Joseph Swan independently invented light bulbs in the late 1870s. In the 1880s, Edison built electricity generating stations near Wall Street and near Holborn in London. And electric motors were already driving manufacturing machinery in the 1880s. And yet by 1900, less than 5% of mechanical drive power at American factories came from motors. It was still the age of steam power, some decades after the light bulb had been invented and commercialized. So the big question then is not what technological wizardry is available to manufacturing managers, to company uh, senior leaders around the world, but what is the combination of technological uh, innovations combined with business models that are emerging that will ensure that these inventions turn into value-creating innovations for companies and industries. To dig into that, I'm delighted to say that we have a, a distinguished and accomplished panel of experts to help us. Uh, Enrique Lores, President and CEO of HP Inc. Joe Kaiser, President and CEO of Siemens AG and Martin Lundstedt, President and CEO of Volvo Group. Welcome everyone to our session today. Let me turn first perhaps to, to Enrique. Uh, Enrique, the pandemic has clearly accelerated uh, awareness of the benefits of the various technologies in uh, fourth industrial revolution. In, in the case of your company, uh, certainly you've uh, put your uh, uh, accelerator pedal uh, to the max on uh, 3D printing uh, and some of the related technologies. Can you tell me uh, going forward, uh, coming out of this current uh, mode of crisis into perhaps a mindset of opportunity, what are your lessons and how are you transforming your own operations uh, in light of this? Yes, first of all, thank you, Vijay, for, for having me here. Really happy to participate in this event. I think, as you are saying, the, we all have learned a lot about what our businesses are going to require in the future and what opportunities we are going to have. And I would like to highlight three key major trends that I think are going to be very important for many, many companies. First of all, we all have seen how the, how the adoption of digital technologies has really accelerated through the pandemic. And this has had an impact in manufacturing, but really has had an impact in many, many other aspects of our lives. How we manage our companies, how we learn, how our kids learn, how we communicate. Second, we have also learned how important it is to have more reliable and resilient manufacturing systems. We need to remember the situation we were facing a few months ago when many countries were in total lockdown mode where hospitals couldn't get parts that they needed for respirators, where doctors didn't have access to masks. And this was a good opportunity to, to show how new technologies can really help and transform and have an impact in, in the world and a positive impact. And third, we have also seen new business models growing, as you are saying. We have seen subscription models really accelerating during the last months. We have seen what we call industries of one, the need and the opportunity of producing products, designing products for an individual, really raising and creating new opportunities. So when we think about the future, we think about these things. First, we think about how do we need to change our internal operations to be more resilient, to build factories closer to our customers, to redesign our manufacturing systems. And clearly technologies, 3D printing, robotics, uh, data management are going to be fundamental to make that happen. But we are also looking at how do we redesign 
the, our systems based on the new models we will be creating. And what do we need to change to be able to build and design products for individuals? So uh, we're hearing several meaty themes uh, ranging from the reminder of the need for resilience and reliability in supply chains, of course, to the need for internal uh, dynamism at your own company uh, to be fit for purpose for a rapidly evolving uh, business environment. And so uh, those are things we're going to pick up on for sure. I want to take the moment to uh, welcome our, our final speaker, Nadia Swarovski, uh, who is the chairperson of the Swarovski Foundation and member of the executive board at Swarovski. Uh, welcome, Nadia. Uh, we're just getting going. I'm glad the technical issues have been overcome and we're delighted to have you with us. Fantastic. Let me, let me turn to uh, Joe. Uh, Joe, uh, you're at the forefront uh, of a, a number of industrial technologies uh, that you're pioneering at your firm, but you also have an inside look through your client base of leading multinationals around the world of what uh, customers are doing. Can you give us a sense of uh, where you see the dynamism? Uh, there has historically been no shortage of enthusiasm of some of the technologies that might revolutionize manufacturing. I've been at The Economist uh, more than 25 years. I can remember writing stories many times about the factory of the future uh, over the ma many numbers of years. Uh, it always seems just around the corner, right? Uh, never quite uh, arrives. Um, what's different this time that'll help us overcome the uh, death by pilot, as it's sometimes called, or the, the obsessive focus with uh, single point operational efficiency that somehow doesn't uh, get the resources, doesn't scale, doesn't get the full C-suite support to transform the way a company does business and instead keeps rooted in an innovation team or a small manufacturing uh, tiger team. Give us a sense of what's changing this time. Uh, first of all, uh, manufacturing matters a lot. Still two thirds of global trade is manufacturing. So we talk about an industry, uh, a sector which, which uh, you know, has an impact on the world. And what we, what we see is that the internet now reaches the industrial world. And that basically means that we have a fundamental change in the way we manufacture, uh, fundamental change uh, in, in such that machines are talking to each other and they learn from what they do uh, and they learn from each other. So instead of having a central governance of how to manage and steer production, we will have a decentralized manufacturing organization. And that basically means, you know, that machines uh, talk to each other and that machines are learning. And that machine learning, in our view, will determine probably the, the biggest thing in manufacturing in the next five years. And what you also see is that the physical world of manufacturing comes together with the virtual world of simulation. <clears throat> and that means that, you know, we do have digital twins of everything, every process, every product, every subject. And that virtual and that digital twin is basically going to be optimized. And the, the optimization which we get from things like artificial intelligence, you know, data analytics, those... Uh, that knowledge, that improvement will go straight back into the manufacturing process. So what you see is product lifecycle management, innovation, and manufacturing excellence, such as productivity, design to cost, and time to market, come together in one. And that is likely to revolutionize the PLM and supply chain managed process in a way that we could expect 40 to 50 percent productivity increase uh, in manufacturing as well as the time and the effort it takes to create new products. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, that's uh, that's, those, those, are, those are provocative words, right? This, these are bold predictions with uh, concrete timelines and, and huge efficiency gains that you're, you're forecasting. So uh, I want to uh, uh, poke at that just a little bit. Um, you know, we're all familiar that in the supply chain arena, uh, the traditional old fashioned sort of planning mindset has been revolutionized in recent years um, with the predictive algorithms, the transformation of data shifting from a 
retrospective or rear looking mindset towards really more of a predictive uh, mindset. But you're talking about the shop floor. You're talking about manufacturing uh, it, within a, a five years or so, moving from what has largely been uh, a centralized operation, at least in design and conception, towards one that may be uh, data driven, bottom up, machine to machine learning, AI embedded, perhaps it goes even to the edges, to the edges of the value chain. And that's uh, right. now, this is kind of talk that I. I, I, when I talk to AI experts or technology consultants, they love talking like this. But you're, you know, you're at the business end of the business. You run a major global company and you have clients that are responsible for delivering products. Um, uh, are they ready? Do they have the mindset in place? I want to move to the human dimension of technology. Do you think managers uh, and workers are ready for a mindset shift because power, when it's decentralized, um, can be disconcerting, can be upsetting to company cultures, to, to old ways of doing things. Um, well, and it, uh, how do you handle that or what do you advise your clients? Well, look, know? I mean, some, some are more and some are less. Uh, and we, as the machine learns, we also need to learn on how to do manufacturing. I mean, it depends on whether you are a disruptor, like somebody who builds electric cars from the green field, or whether you, for example, Martin, please jump in because you're one of the most advanced uh, companies in understanding what that means. Really, uh, Wolfo, in many ways, have you know have learned it uh, to come back uh, big time and, and and change the process. So it is a massive mindset change. Uh, you know, especially the ones who own brownfield operation who go from something they have to defend into something you know they need to let go, and that's massive. And typically, you know, the, the incumbents are the ones who are the least prepared for the next big thing because they've got a lot to lose. The greenfielders uh, are easier to get convinced about new technologies, applications, right. because right. they've got nothing to lose. So think about the Tesla, the legacy, uh, assets the Tesla the example assets. versus, you know, the legacy automotive. Big struggle. Right. So the jury is out. But Martin, why don't you jump in? You know exactly, I guess, what I mean. It's an excellent segue, Martin. Let's uh, give us your perspective on this. Uh, as a venerable brand uh, known around the world, how is it you've been able to take on the, the challenge of legacy mindset uh, when it comes to new manufacturing approaches? Uh, no, uh, thank you for that, uh, VJ, and also thank you, Joe, for, for I mean, the, that segue. And, and to start with, uh, I, I think what is important, what Joe talked about when it comes to the decentralized way of utilizing this power is also to actually work a lot with a decentralized way in your company, uh, that you really have the empowerment and ownership out in the different parts of the operation so they feel that they want to embrace the change because that is the way that they will continue to develop and own the business. So I'm a big fan also from a company culture and leadership to really drive the decentralization with full uh, as much as possible, PL responsibility full out. And we see that that uh, will also make the change happening in, in these type of uh, embracing technologies. And having said that, I, what I think is important, I will come just in a minute to the product definition of it, uh, because in the heavy vehicle industry that we are representing, of course, for trucks and construction machinery, etc., the good news is that we are already into mass customization. We are, we are producing uh, production equipment for our customers. We are a true B2B model as well, meaning that we are not today building platforms that are one size fits all that the car industry is doing. And thereby we can mitigate this change now into electromobility, utilizing the new technologies. And by the way, uh, this will also make, make a redefinition of scale because scale of economies has been one of the killers of big incumbents. So they have built them into big structures. Uh, and with the new technologies, you're much more flexible of actually doing the reading of value chains, being less vulnerable and driving the decentralization and still have, uh, to use point also with the digital twins, um, very good opportunities both for the uh, manufacturing uh, footprint and environment to, to learn from each other around the globe, but also when it comes to the whole product development process. And just one example of that is, of course, that we have today in our uh, customer base more than one point, I think it's 1.2 million machines and um, trucks and buses uh, connected to us today uh, that are constantly feeding us with data. 
And we are utilizing that, of course, to improve our algorithm for the coming product development, but also to feedback uh, through remote downloading, optimizing, because a lot of the optimization for our products today is done through software. Uh, so, so it's coming not only for our own manufacturing system, but also for the production system of our customers that is really the logistic systems for the future. So uh, we see that how that is applied in a good way. I think one very important lesson that we have done is that people love to collect data, but you need to have a plan how to organize, how to make available, uh, how to analyze and how to make action out of it. And on the four last steps, I think people are spending too little time to really understand why should you have all this data if you're not having a good idea of actually doing it actionable for, for value creation for the customers or for your own operation? Martin, let's, let's, let me um, put your feet to the fire on that. Um, uh, with this massive data deluge that you're now getting um, and you make the wise point that you need to understand and make sense of that data, give us one insight that your own company has gleaned over the last few years by adopting this smarter approach. What's something you learned or are doing now that before you entered this age of sensors and everything, data collection, smart analytics, that you might not have figured out? What's a, what's a surprise or something new you're doing or it's something you couldn't do before? No, no, what I think we have always argued about, of course, our ability to customize different products and what that will mean for uh, wear and tear solutions for our customers, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, shorter service intervals, etc. The good news now with all the data, if we are really pinpointing a specific subject that we really would like to improve, like uh, the maintenance schedules, for example, for, for, for trucks, that is a pretty big uh, a thing for our customers, uh, we are actually much better now by both uh, pinpointing specific applications in regions, but also utilizing the global data to really through uh, 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 machine learning, artificial intelligence to see what are the underlying patterns of improving these service intervals. And they have been improved, you know, with uh, 25, 30, 50 percent, depending on the region and application. And it's a huge value. Uh, for the customers. The same goes for energy efficiency. The other part is the whole route planning now when uh, battery range applications will be a big issue. Uh, so, so you have a number of very concrete things, but you need to start with what do you want to achieve? And then you can dig upstream with your data streams and, and really organize it in a good way and also applying them the intelligence that you Joe was into. Right. The old adage, garbage in, garbage out still works. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go to uh, oh, only uh, faster, uh, only faster. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. We have a higher efficiency processing of the garbage now. Uh, Nadia, well, you uh, you've seen that digitization has been a theme that uh, everyone has touched on thus far. But uh, the industry that you're in, uh, luxury goods, is a high touch. is a it's is almost the opposite of some of the traditional commoditized industries. And yet, it seems that some of the same techniques uh, that um, uh, digitization can bring uh, knowledge of the consumer, B2C engagement, follow on sales, trust, authenticity might affect your industry as well. Can you give us a perspective on how that's advancing and how the challenges are different in your business? Absolutely. And I think you're uh, so right. It is really high touch, you know, and um, this is it. We call it low tech. And uh, despite this advancement in innovation and technology and manufacturing, what we also feel is really incredibly important within the fashion, jewelry, home decor industry, luxury goods industry, is certainly also the human touch, the human involvement. At the end of the day, we're talking about um, a designer's vision, which he or she is creating for the end consumer. So I think that human element is absolutely important. The tactile element is important. Um, in this crisis of last year, um, statistically, it's been fascinating to say, see how the fashion industry's sales have declined by 30%. Um, yet overall, within um, that decline, we've seen that an increase of online sales has occurred with 29%. So the entire industry really had to embrace the digitalization, not just to reach out to the consumer uh, in a more proactive way, but also as an industry uh, amongst itself. And that's another thing that I think um, this uh, modern day and age has really enabled is still that human connectivity while we're all locked away at home. Um, 
the teams are communicating with each other. They are um, really also keeping each other inspired, keeping the connection to the customer in order to enable the continuation of product design, uh, product manufacturing. Uh, within the fashion industry, what's also been so fascinating to see is this 360 degree digitalization. So usually we have two fashion seasons. Now we're talking about no more fashion seasons, but just really being open, uh, not just to the trade, but also to the end consumer, uh, 365 days a year. We have seen uh, virtual fashion shows. We've seen virtual showrooms. We have seen virtual sh uh, try-on sessions. So the connection certainly is there. Um, and um, it really um, has also sparked a, a slightly different artistic approach in terms of how the designers are presenting their collections. And nonetheless, with the digital approach, um, there's still that integration of the zeitgeist of what's happening. And once again, we see fashion um, and design in general as a very strong reflection of what's happening well, Daria, tell us a little bit more. You, you, you um, mentioned right at the end that uh, you were even seeing a different kind of design ethos. Um, that gets to a little bit of the innovation uh, part of the question. How is the way that we interact with luxury goods through digital platforms and in a, you know, a different kind of mindset today, how is that affecting the design of them, now, which, of course, is connected to how one might make them? So one certainly is talking about form follows function. And I think what's this, what this entire pandemic has sparked is really kind of um, a thought back to our roots and purpose. So I think uh, designs are becoming more purpose driven and certainly more sustainable. I mean, we ask ourselves, why are we in this pandemic? And uh, we've seen the climate change, we're feeling the climate change. So, you know, the fashion industry being one of the biggest contributors to the um, environmental negative output is realizing that actually um, things can be produced differently. Um, this certainly um, has let the designers also look at their supply chains. A lot of designers weren't able to get their uh, materials uh, either um, shipped or um, products even made. So I think a wonderful thing that has also happened in my thing, in my opinion, it's a wonderful thing is that a localization of manufacturing has happened. Um, and one th for, uh, just to give you one example, in New York, for example, in the garment district, a lot of people are unemployed. So there are a lot of efforts being made to keep people employed, whether if it's not making um, uh, fashion, then it's making uh, fabric shopping bags that people still might use. So, you know, uh, I think there is an incredible sense of benevolence within the industry, people reaching out to each other and certainly trying to um, keep themselves going. But again, sustainability um, sure. is a interesting. Uh, in some ways, that's a counterintuitive trend, right? Many companies are cash strapped at the moment because of the pandemic. And yet we are seeing lots of indicators that interest in and concern about climate change about and willingness to invest behind sustainability has continued and in some ways perhaps has accelerated as companies think about their next digital platform, keeping in mind the carbon footprint or other aspects of sustainability, as you point out. Uh, thank you, Nadia. Let's, um, we have a, a host of questions coming up. Uh, let me um, also see, I think, did I see one of my panelists indicated they wanted to uh, jump in? Enrique, did I see you uh, motion? Did you want to jump in on something? I wanted, to, I wanted to compliment the comment that Martin was making. I think what, what we have learned during the last month is that when the combination of technology can be used to create new value propositions to customers? Can we really do something that we couldn't do for customers before? Is when magic happens. Is when really we see new business models being created, new industries being created. And I think the example Nadia was bringing is perfect to that. We are seeing the need for local production, and this is really driving people to come with new ideas. And when they are reinforced by technology, really amazing things can happen. And this is, part of what I think we're going to be seeing during the next months and years. We have a question um, from uh, Nitin uh, Joglekar, who's asking uh, a lot of the innovation in supply chain uh, happen in middle tier and SMEs. Um, how will the digitization and business model opportunities reach them? Now, we know, of course, the, the recession has been quite difficult for smaller companies. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's no denying that's where a lot of innovation happens. Any, uh, anyone want to jump in on that and offer a thought on what might be the effect of the new tools and technologies uh, as it affects uh, little, uh, smaller companies? 
if I may, maybe to start there, uh, uh, I mean, we are working, of course, in our supply chains, but also with our customers that are, in many uh, cases, uh, small and mid-sized enterprises. I mean, the fact that we are, uh, of course, with the right balance, with, uh, with the data protection, obviously, uh, being able to share more real facts of what is happening out in our customers' operation, what do, do they need to think about when it comes to their input, for example, in our value chains. It's much easier to interact around facts and give the opportunity to innovate from real use cases uh, with their expertise, etc. So I think that is one example of how it's strengthening actually the, uh, the, the connection in the value chains. Uh, because what we see now is, uh, for example, moving into electromobility on the heavy duty side is much about confidence, who can uh, go together. And then we can bring facts to the customers. We, we see together what is their route planning. You will be fine with the range. You will be fine with the grid capacity. And we can build up a, a system solution around this, uh, also including a lot of uh, our partners in the ecosystem, since a lot of the utility things and, and also infrastructure charging is local. So, so yes, to, to bring uh, the data that you have uh, and elaborate that uh, is uh, super important to make these new uh, things happening around, not at least uh, the electromobility and the, and the hydrogen journey. Thank you, Martin. Um, you know, uh, time flies when you're having fun, and we've had a, a phenomenal uh, overview of the future of manufacturing in, uh, from our leaders here. Uh, in the one minute I have left, I'm actually going to do something risky. I'm going to give you each a chance to sum up your sentiment, your feeling about um, the future of manufacturing as it connects to growth in one word. I'm going to do a round robin, put you on the spot before we sign off from this uh, live session. Uh, let me start. Uh, perhaps I'll uh, uh, start with Enrique. One word that captures your mood at the moment. I, I would use optimism. I think the amount of change is okay. opening a lot of opportunities. Optimism it is. Joe, how about you? Excited to bring more people out of poverty by using technology. Okay, so an excitement about the opportunity. Uh, Martin? I think uh, decentralization, regional value chains, much closer and thereby uh, serving customers right. in a faster way. A decentralization vision we come back to again. And Nadia, your word. Growth ambition to be teamed up with environmental and mm -hmm. social positive impact. Okay, well, that's that's more than one word, but it's a, it's a powerful statement. <laughs> and, uh, very hard. <laughs> I will make an exception for you. Uh, thank you. And it's an inspirational note to end on as well.